Thank you. I am the last uh, speaker. Um, I don't speak French, so it's in English. I apologize. Uh, leaf roll management, preventing an epidemic, how research and wine industry combine their efforts. The problem, um, leaf roll. Yep. the problem, leaf roll three, or grapevine leaf roll associated virus three, Firstly, and most importantly, uh, leaf roll three is specific to Vetus species only. It is not present uh, in other plants and cannot be transferred uh, to weeds or other plants nearby. In the past, the infections uh, started from the propagation material and spread from vine to vine. Uh, but more recently, propagators and certification schemes uh, should have eliminated uh, leaf roll three from the planting material. Leaf roll three cannot be transferred from vine to vine by sap uh, or secateurs or trimmers. Uh, however, mealybug, the main vector, uh, can be transferred to, from block to block on uh, machinery or plant debris. The vector is, uh, leaf roll three is mealybug uh, and sometimes soft scales. However, the soft scales are relatively slow moving and it is the mealybug that are the main vector in New Zealand. There are two species, Citrophilus uh, pseudococcus calcellarii and uh, on the left, the long-tailed uh, mealybug pseudococcus longospinus on the right. The photo on the lower left shows Citrophilus mealybug uh, colonizing the roots of the grapevine. Um, the New Zealand species are different than the species of uh, mealybug that you have in France, and I think you have Planococcus ficus and Planococcus citri. Uh, the mealybug is very efficient at transmitting the virus, and the crawlers are mobile and hard to see. Females lay 200 to 400 eggs with up to three generations a year, so uh, numbers can build up very quickly. The virus is described as semi-persistent, uh, in order to transmit the virus, the mealybug must feed on an infected vine, and if it then moves and feeds on an uninfected vine, it will transmit the virus. If, however, the mealybug moves to a weed species or another plant, they will lose uh, the virus quite quickly, we think around four days for these uh, two species. So leaf roll symptoms, uh, we always start at the basal leaves. As the disease or titer level increases, the whole vine becomes infected, and that's some advanced symptoms. And the advanced symptoms show uh, the typical downward rolling of the leaf um, with red areas between the veins while the veins remain green. Some more mild symptoms, uh, blotchy red between the veins at the leaf margins without a lot of leaf rolling at, at this point. Leaf roll three can be confused with uh, magnesium deficiency, but a trained uh, eye can see the difference. Magnesium deficiency is normally lighter red in color and does not occupy all the area between the veins, but comes to a characteristic point while the center uh, of the leaf remains green. Advanced symptoms in white varieties we can see advanced symptoms in white varieties, but most likely uh, very late in the infection process. In other words, the vines have probably been infected for some time uh, before we see the symptoms. So the mealybugs have had time to spread the virus before symptoms are visible. Sauvignon Blanc uh, presents not really any symptoms, uh, but in this case, some very misleading symptoms. Um, so visual identification of white varieties is not a reliable method. Um, leaf roll three affects fruit quality, uh, reduced sugars, reduced flavor compounds, and reduced color in red wines. Uh, typically in New Zealand, uh, fruit on leaf roll three infected vines is two bricks lower than uh, healthy vines. Many New Zealand winemakers have made separate wines um, from infected and uninfected fruit, and in all cases, the effects on wine quality and color can easily be observed. These uh, in-house trials 
while not scientific, have prompted many uh, New Zealand companies to adopt a zero tolerance to leaf roll three in their vineyard. And this slide shows a relatively young uh, Pinot Noir vine with a, a very big crop. Uh, the vine is early in the infection process and the virus not yet distributed to both sides of the vine. While it is an extreme case, it clearly shows the effect of virus on red varieties, uh, just in the colour of the fruit and level of ripeness. Virus also affects yield. And this table is a study by Nimmo Bell in 2006 on a Merlot vineyard in the Hawke's Bay. The table clearly shows the effects on virus over six years of the study. Um, the first line shows the um, yield in tonnes per hectare of the vines not infected by leaf roll three, and the second line, the yields uh, from the vines infected from the infected vines. The third line is the percentage difference. And the fourth line shows the alarming percentage increase in the number of vines infected each year. A similar table for Sauvignon Blanc in Marlborough, um, which is not quite so straightforward and shows the seasonal effects uh, of the impact on yields. Um, the average loss of yield is 14% uh, per year. We have also looked at the sugar accumulation in Sauvignon Blanc, and while the differences are not clear, and it appears to be seasonal dependent as well, the graph shows uh, the BRICS measurements at three vineyards in three different locations in Marlborough. Uh, a significant difference in BRICS in, in 2012, a slight difference in 2013, but uh, no difference in 2014. So the virus elimin elimination project, um, the first three-year project concent on, concentrated on two uh, premium red producing areas, the Gimlet Gravels and Martinborough. Uh, both the Gimlet Gravels and Martinborough Grower Associations approached Dr. Rod uh, Bonfiglioli, a member of New Zealand Wine Growers Research, uh, and he drafted the first proposal for the project. I'm going to talk mainly about the Gimlet Gravels as this is where most of the research has been focused. And the Gimlet Gravels uh, is a defined area of alluvial soils in the Hawke's Bay, uh, 800 hectares, uh, producing premium red wine, mainly Syrah and Merlot, Cabernet Franc, also some Cabernet Sauvignon and some Malbec. The Gimlet Gravels has a strong proactive uh, grower association uh, for promotional activities, but also, also for sharing technical information. In 2008, it became clear to the Gimlet Gravels Association that the red wine quality was suffering from the effects of leaf roll three, um, and the virus was being spread by mealybug at an alarming rate. Uh, and for a number of years, Dr. Bonfiglioli had been in communication with Professor Gerhard Peterson from the University of Pretoria in South Africa, where leaf roll three was also uh, affecting wine quality in the vineyards near Stellenbosch. Uh, Dr. Bonfiglioli and Professor Peterson advocated a three-stage approach to the issue um, to identify the infected vines, uh, remove the infected vines, and at the same time control the mealybug. Uh, Dr. Bonfiglioli also recognised the need to educate growers on how to do this and how to make it part of their annual management plan. Um, he believed an area-wide approach was also necessary and would give us the best chance of success. The Gimlet Gravels funded a pilot mapping study in 2008 and New Zealand Wine Growers uh, project co-funded by the Sustainable Farming Fund commenced in 2009 and sadly the same year that uh, Dr. Bonfiglioli passed away. Um, so the project team, uh, Dr. Gerhard Peterson, a virologist from the University of Pretoria, Dr. Simon Hooker, who's uh, here today with us, New Zealand uh, Re Wine Growers Research Man Manager, and uh, Dr. Vaughan Bell, uh, he's the entomology for, entomologist from Plant and Food Research, Ruby Andrews, uh, New Zealand Wine Growers, who was in charge of communication, and Kane Thompson, uh, for the mapping and his company of Spatial Solutions, and myself as the project leader. The project team realised the significant proportion of the budget was needed for the communication with growers. 
uh, to ensure that they understood the importance of their vineyards' action, actions and that the buy-in would come if the growers uh, could visualise the extent of the problem in their vineyards. Um, the project team identified three separate areas of equal importance for the project to be successful. Uh, the research, the mapping and the communications. So what did we already know? Uh, we knew that the mealybug are the main vector of leaf roll three. We knew that Citrophilus mealybug can feed on roots and transfer the virus from the roots of infected vines. In fact, some replanted blocks had already been reinfected from the remnant roots. We knew that the action had to be immediate as mealybug could spread virus from low levels, less than 5% to greater than 50% within five years. So the project focused on the immediate actions to halt the spread, uh, controlling mealybug, uh, removing infected vines, um, so that's the practical and communications component, but there are also a number of questions that needed answering, so the research component. The research questions were what was the extent of the problem, uh, what was the best practice for controlling mealybugs, could growers reliably visually identify virus vines each season, and what was the optimum timing for the visual assessment? Did growers need to remove the symptomatic vine only or should they remove the neighbouring vines as well? So the, the first question was answered by the mapping. Uh, the mapping was needed to understand the extent of the problem and then to measure the success or otherwise of the actions taken. The team also realised that if growers could map their own blocks, they would become aware of the extent of the problem and more likely to want to solve uh, their sit or improve their situation by removing infected vines. So Spatial Solutions, a geotech company with links to the wine industry, uh, provided handheld GPS units and grower training uh, for the mapping exercise. The growers marked each infected vine position with their handheld GPS. The points were downloaded by Spatial Solutions and plotted on the map of the Gimlet Gravels. Uh, all the growers were provided with individual maps for their blocks each year. Um, while quite hard to see, all those uh, black dots you see represent one virus vine. In the initial stages of the project, the growers had preconceived ideas about the virus incidents in their own blocks, and it wasn't until the area was mapped um, that the growers could see the extent of the issue and that they all needed to work together. So the results of five years of mapping show a significant and steady reduction in the virus incidents. This slide shows the percentage uh, virus incidents over the 800 hectares of the Gimlet Gravels. Um, and we have one more year of mapping to complete the current project and we're hoping to see that reduced to perhaps 1.5%. Uh, the growers removed uh, 31,000 vines in the first year of the project alone. Um, and this, this figure doesn't include any of the blocks that were over 20% infected, 20% uh, infected blocks were uh, deemed to be the cutoff point for the successful individual vine removal or, or roguing. So this slide shows the total number of individual vines removed uh, over the years. Uh, I think it t totals 100,000, somewhere around there. And this slide shows the number of hectares over 20% uh, as the blocks have been removed and replanted. So there's only uh, 11 point something hectares left uh, to be replanted. So questions uh, two, three and four were answered by the research. And the research was carried out by uh, Vaughan Bell, uh, who monitored 12 trial sites across the Gimlet Gravels. So question two was, what was the best, pra or best practice for controlling mealybugs? And, and uh, Vaughan collected 400 leaves from each, from each site uh, every year, each year and counted the mealybugs and mealybug crawlers on those leaves. And this graph uh, summarises his work uh, from, from 2013. And the grey bars relate to the scale on the left and show the number of mealybugs per 100 leaves. 
and the red dots relate to the scale on the right and show the percentage of virus incident. And as you can see, the trial sites with high millibag numbers also had high virus incidence. He also analysed the spray diaries of all these trial blocks. And from the spray diary data, we could see that growers who were controlling millibugs well were using significantly higher water rates than those who had poor control. Uh, the dormant spray of tocothion or protheophos needed to be applied at 1,000 litres per hectare. And the two flowering sprays needed to be applied at greater than 500 litres per hectare. These findings were communicated to the growers and quickly became part of the best practice recommendation. There was also concern from the growers regarding the regular and or long-term use of insecticides and the message to them was to use the insecticides while removing the virus. Once there were low levels of virus in the vineyard, then growers could think about reducing the mealybug control sprays. And this chart was to help growers manage and monitor their risk uh, when and applying the mealybug controls uh, if required. Question three, could growers reliably visually identify virus vines each season and what was the optimum timing for visual assessment? So Vaughan calibrated his visual identification over two years with ELISA uh, of the symptomatic and non-symptomatic vines and the results showed that visual identification was very accurate, 98.6%. Uh, I think he only found four vines that he identified with symptoms and were later found to be negative by ELISA. And to determine the best time for visual identification, uh, Vaughan visited the sites a total of seven times from the start of Verizon, and the graph shows his results. Um, so late, late season identification is, is critical to identify all the virus vines. And again, the recommendation to the growers is to visually assess vines as late as possible, but before any defoliation or frost events occur. Question four, did growers need to remove the symptomatic vines only or should they remove the neighbouring vine as well? The growers wanted to know if it was sufficient to remove the infected vine only or should they take a harder approach and remove the na some neighbouring vines. So, in the same trial block, Vaughan analysed the data to assess the risk of the neighbouring vine physicians becoming infected. He labelled these, uh, the first vines, the second vines, the opposite vines, and the diagonal vines. There's also a fifth category, uh, random vines. And so the results graph shows the percentage incident of virus symptomatic vines in these positions each year. Our initial thoughts were that removing the symptomatic vines only would be sufficient. However, there was speculation that the delay in virus symptoms showing might mean that the neighbouring vines were already infected and should also be removed, um, but this was not the case. The percentage of first vines that showed symptoms in the year following the removal of the infected vines was 26% uh, in 20 2010, meaning that 74% of those first vines showed uh, no symptoms and were not infected, and removing them would have meant removing a lot, a lot of vines that were not infected. For example, if there are 100 symptomatic vines um, and we wanted to remove the, the first vines, we would need to remove a further 200 vines, so a total of 300. In fact, only 26 of those 200 would have been infected, so we would have removed 174 uninfected vines. So uh, the other part of this graph um, was good news that um, the, the random infections, that is vines and not any of those positions, had dropped away to, to almost zero. So no new infections appearing. Um, and this could be partly due to the better millibug control or, or it could be the reduced inoculum of virus. Removing vines because a virus means replanting and the associated difficulties of getting replants established in mature vineyards. At the start of the project, it had already been established that replanted vines were at risk of becoming reinfected by subterranean mealybug on remnant roots. 
and for this reason growers were not confident about replanting vines. So we needed to provide some best practice um, so that growers could have this confidence. Initially the recommendation was to try and kill the root systems using applications of herbicide painted onto the cut trunks. Um, some of the replanted vines, uh, as you can see here, some symptoms on a replanted vine showed virus symptoms in the first autumn after planting. Uh, in fact, mealybug could be seen on the roots uh, just 12 days after replanting. So the science team established trials that found that the roots were not killed by application of herbicide to the cut trunks. The roots still supported mealybug and uh, the roots were still positive uh, by ELISA for leaf roll three. So the best practice recommendations were changed to a soil drench of imidacloprid, a systemic insecticide, um, in the autumn before the mature vine was removed, and then another uh, imidacloprid soil drench applied to the new vine immediately on replanting. And this graph shows the inc low incidence of virus on 40 hectares of replanted vineyard uh, over four years. So. Uh, using the best practice recommendations, the number of infected vines is very low, uh, lower than 0.5 per cent. So the communications, um, the aim of the communications was to ensure that uh, the information reached the growers as soon as possible. Uh, and we, we used a number of avenues to do this. Uh, grower regional workshops. We, two per year, we've done more than 50 workshops with the growers now. Um, popular articles in the grower magazine and on, on the New Zealand Wine Growers website. Uh, we had fact sheets, as you can see up there on the right hand side. Um, and there was now 13 separate fact sheets. We send out email reminders to the growers when it's time to do specific uh, actions. We have a, a online Flickr library um, for virus identification, so growers can, can look at the, the uh, symptoms on, online. Uh, and this has had 14,000 views to date and um, probably 20,000 by the time we get to the end of the project. We have some videos uh, online on YouTube. Um, they're, they're relatively few downloads at this point, but extremely useful for presentations. Um, we have a blog, a social media, uh, with monthly posts on virus control. And we have also recently put out a, a smartphone app, um, which you see in the top uh, left corner there, which gathers all this information together so growers can look at it out in the field when they need to. And the final uh, output for the project will, will be a, uh, an e-book or maybe a printed book. So um, in summary, the first project focused on developing best practice and reducing uh, incidents in red varieties in the Gimlet gravels and in Martinborough. And now we're into the second project. Um, in, these, in these two areas, um, I believe we have adverted an epidemic. Um, if the increases we were seeing at the start of the project had continued for another one or two years, it would have been too late and all likelihood would have meant replanting um, the entire area. So the second project included the rollout to the rest of the industry, uh, some new work on white variety assessment, uh, reducing reliance on chemical control and successful replanting of vines. We, were, we are able to show the rest of the New Zealand industry case studies um, from the successful outcomes on the Gimlet gravels and could also provide a clear picture of what would happen if they did nothing. Uh, this will ensure that other wine growing regions, which include Auckland, Gisborne, Greater Hawke's Bay, Canterbury, Marlborough and Central Otago do not ever reach the situation where there's a likelihood of a leaf roll three epidemic. So uh, my sincere <coughs> thanks to the virus team, um, particularly Dr. Vaughan Bell, who, who carried out most of this research and Ruby Andrew uh, the communications, uh, Kane Thompson for the mapping, Dr Simon Hooker um, and the Gimlet Gravels Association and the growers. Uh, my thanks also to the organisers of the seminar, um, particularly Olivier Jeffroy, uh, but also Laurent Odugon and Olivier Jobrigay who's left.
Thank you.